Hello, in this video we will be talking about the conservation of momentum, how we take the ideas of the momentum of a system and apply it to a conservation style problem. First, just for fun, here's something from your data booklet that we can take a look at. There is a version of the kinetic energy equation that uses momentum. Uh, so we'll derive this pretty quickly here just to show uh, there's certainly a relationship between all these variables as momentum is the product of mass and velocity, which are both included in the kinetic energy equation. Uh, if I wanted, I could isolate and solve for velocity in terms of momentum and mass. I could plug that into my kinetic energy equation. I notice some cancellation of mass here, and I end up with this equation. Kinetic energy is momentum squared over twice the mass of the object moving, whose kinetic energy I care about. This is just a reminder, really, that this equation is in your uh, data booklet. It is useful uh, sometimes in specific situations, especially some of the later units, honestly. But this can be a useful equation if you uh, know the momentum of an object and don't know its velocity right off the bat. This can be a very quick way to do it, especially to talk about the relationship between kinetic energy and momentum. So just don't forget that this is in your data booklet and topic. Um, in topic two, it is, uh, it's, it's in there. All right, so let's talk about conservation of momentum. This idea of conservation of momentum and where it comes from and where it comes from is Newton's third law. So let's say we have two objects that are going to uh, interact with each other. The idea is these two objects make up my system and we can say that the momentum of a system is conserved so long as no net external force acts on the system. If you're defining this, if you're defining conservation of momentum, you want to describe that that means the momentum of a system does not change. We do want to kind of define what we mean by conserve. So it stays the same or does not change. So make sure that makes it into your definition. So if two objects collide, there are no net external forces because the only forces we have are internal. These two objects will smash into each other and as they do, they exert forces on each other. We know from Newton's third law, those are equal and opposite forces. Force of A on B equals the force of B on A. But these are the only forces that we're dealing with in a collision is these internal forces. There are, we're assuming no forces outside of the uh, system. So we can take that idea and apply it. We know these two forces are equal, so we can show where this idea of the conservation of momentum comes from. Those two forces are equal but opposite. Let's get them out of here. So the rate of change of momentum of each object have the same size but opposite direction. Therefore, it doesn't matter how long it takes. The change in momentum of object B must be equal to the change in momentum of object A, just in the opposite direction. This comes from the uh, Newton's third law and Newton's second law combined. And when we combine those two laws, we see if I add the changes of each object together, I get zero. In other words, the change in momentum of the system is zero. This is what we mean by conservation of momentum. There is no change in the momentum of the system as long as these are the only forces we're talking about. In other words, I can say my initial momentum equals my final momentum for the system, and it's going to be very similar to our conservation of energy style problems. So let's look at one. We can look at a problem where we have uh, dynamics carts. This is similar to the uh, demonstration that we did in class. We have one cart traveling east, another cart travels west at the same speed, but one is double the mass of the other. After the collision, the larger cart rebounds much slower to the east, and we can find the velocity of the 500 gram cart after the collision. Since there's two objects, I need the initial momentum of each object and the final momentum of each object to set this up. So you'll see it's very similar to a conservation of energy problem as I set the initial momentum of the whole system equal to the final momentum of the whole system. And then I have to think through what objects do I have in my system that have momentum in the initial condition, which will be before they collide. And then I think through what objects have momentum in my system after at the point of my final condition, which is after they collide. 
this is really nice because I don't have to worry about what happens during the collision then, which is very complicated. I have it constantly changing force. It happens very quickly. It's almost impossible to measure with a lot of precision what's happening during that collision. But here I just have to deal with the before and after, and it'll work. So we're going to plug in our values here. Half a kilogram, one kilogram, two meters per second. Notice two meters per second west, we're going to use negative four. To represent to the west or to the left or in the negative x direction. And then when it rebounds, it rebounds with a uh, velocity of 0.5 meters per second to the east, so it's positive over here. So I have everything I need except for this uh, final velocity of the first cart. I can solve for it and find that it's three meters per second. And if you do this uh, demonstration, or if you remember from class, you will see that it rebounds back quicker, noticeably quicker than it came in. And that comes from conservation of momentum. So similar to some of the other problems, the, the main things to keep in mind with a conservation of momentum problem are direction, the sign of all of the values that you put in there, and having a good picture of all the objects that are uh, moving in your system. Okay, there are two types of collisions that we'll talk about. The first is called an elastic collision. That's uh, a collision where the, there's a lot of bounce, you can think of it. And in this collision, type of collision, kinetic energy is conserved. The idea is during the collision, there's deformation of the uh, objects that are colliding. So you hit a tennis ball with your tennis racket. If you watch some videos of this in action, you see the tennis ball actually compress. And the tennis ball compresses, compresses and squeezes, and what it's doing is it's storing all of the energy as elastic energy, elastic potential energy. And then as it uh, reforms itself, it releases that elastic potential energy and becomes all kinetic again. So by storing that energy as elastic energy, we conserve the kinetic energy. The opposite would be called an inelastic collision. And this would be a collision where kinetic energy is not conserved. We're losing energy to heat, sound, friction, things like this. Uh, in real life, basically every collision is an inelastic collision to some extent, but a lot of collisions we can model as elastic. They're close enough that we pretty much don't lose any kinetic energy to these kinds of things. Uh, and of course, in physics problems, we're going to deal with perfect situations where we really don't lose any kinetic energy. No matter what, though, momentum is conserved. This idea of conservation of momentum just comes from Newton's laws. And so it will always be conserved in a collision. While you might lose kinetic energy, the momentum of the system will always stay the same. So if you have an elastic collision, you might end up with a, a system of equations where you're setting up a conservation of momentum problem on top of a conservation of like kinetic energy problem. Those are very exciting. Let's look at one more example. This will be an inelastic collision. And this we call a completely inelastic collision. A, a completely inelastic collision is a collision where the objects stick together. Uh, I know that this is elastic because there's no rebound and because um, as they stick together, there's some energy used up in the kind of friction and uh, combination of these two. So this is an inelastic collision. If you ever see objects sticking together, you know it's an inelastic collision. So again, I'm going to set this up as initial momentum equals final momentum. So the momentum of my system in this initial situation is equal to the momentum of my system in this final situation. In the beginning, I have two objects. I have cart one and cart two. At the end, though, I really just have one object. So what I'm going to do for my final momentum is do the total mass of the system times the final speed of the whole moving system. And of course, we can see that the second cart starts from rest. So really, I just have m1 u1 the initial momentum of this cart equals the final momentum of the total system and i can solve for v and see how this relates to the other masses i can also think through this is an interesting equation you can think about what this means if mass 2 is much 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 bigger than mass 1 what it means if mass 2 is much 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 smaller than mass 1 you can get some pretty extreme kind of results
In this case, though, uh, it's double the size, so all things, relatively speaking, it's not that crazy. Uh, and I end up with going like two thirds of a meter per second. So a very noticeable slowdown because the uh, one way we can think of this is the mass of the system has increased. Uh, the, well, the mass has increased compared to the momentum here. The mass has increased by a factor of three. So my velocity has decreased by a factor of three. But this conservation of momentum will show us where that comes from. There are other types of collisions. Uh, one is called an explosion which is sometimes not as exciting as it sounds. Uh, one example the IB likes is to have two ice skaters who are uh, holding each other and they push off of each other. That is technically an explosion. Uh, so this is where I start with zero momentum, two objects in contact, and then they forcefully push apart from one another. Cannon is an example one, a firearm. Uh, again, two people pushing off of each other on an icy pond. All of that stuff qualifies as an explosion. So the idea is that the initial momentum of the system is zero, and then uh, with the like ignition of some gunpowder, a cannonball goes moving to the right, and a cannon goes moving to the left. That's recoil. That idea of recoil comes from conservation of momentum. If there was no momentum in the system to begin, now the cannonball is moving with the momentum to the right, the momentum of the system must still be zero, so there must be an equal negative momentum gained by the cannon itself. And that's why this cannon will recoil. And of course, because it has a much larger mass, it won't have nearly as high a speed, but it will recoil with some speed backwards. That's why they put wheels on these uh, old cannons. So let's look at one. Uh, recoil velocity tells me that this is an explosion problem. So I have a rifle firing a bullet of 5 grams with this velocity, and we can find the recoil velocity of the rifle. So the initial momentum of the system is zero. Everything's at rest. And then I just have two objects afterwards, the bullet and the rifle, so I'll use B and R for those subscripts. So if I solve for this, the velocity of the rifle is negative mbvb over mr and it should make sense that it's negative because if the bullet moves with a positive velocity the rifle has to move with negative velocity to recoil plugging in the mass velocity and other mass to make sure we use kilograms for everything we'll find less than one meter per second so because it's so much larger it's a much 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 lower speed but it is the same momentum forward and backwards so that's an explosion problem. The initial momentum of the system is zero. The other momentums essentially cancel each other out, but we can find useful information from there. One more type of problem you might see is with a rocket or a water jet. Uh, they call these water jets sometimes because they'll have uh, literally a jet of water being shot out of something and it gains momentum. But this is how a rocket ship moves, this is how anything in space has to move, is by doing this sort of explosion in a momentum sense. Uh, here's a good picture. A rocket ship is going to expel gas out of its back, and there's so much of it, you might imagine gas is very light, but there's so much of it moving so quickly that it gains a, a significant amount of momentum moving in this direction, which means the rocket itself has to gain momentum in this direction. And therefore the rocket can move. Even in space where there's no air and nothing to push off of, this conservation of momentum will work. All right, this is the only way that you can move yourself if you uh, find yourself floating through the vast emptiness of space, find something in your pocket and chuck it the other way, and you will move backwards. Uh, but that's the only way you can move. You can't swim through space. There's nothing to push on, nothing to push off of. Conservation of momentum is your only hope. Uh, so this would be uh, this kind of uh, uh, problem. When you set these up, you're going to deal with a delta M over delta T. You're going to deal with a rate of change of mass. We're going to say the rocket is giving off however many kilograms per second of fuel, and we'll use that to find it's maybe the force or the change of momentum or whatever we need. In that case, we would do delta M over delta T times V to get my rate of change of momentum.
or just delta m times v to get the change in momentum. Yeah, where v would be the speed with which the gas is being shot out. So here you go. That's what this would look like in those contexts. So there you have it. Those are the types of problems that you might see in conservation of momentum. You might do with inelastic collisions, with elastic collisions. But conservation of momentum works very similar to conservation of energy. Uh, you just have to be thoughtful about the problem that you're looking at and apply it to those. So like all things, we will look at some exciting applications together uh, and we will see what they look like. Have fun.